Go on. Yeah. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Policy Idol 2022! Yes, at last! At last. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, they say, and I, I hope, like me, that uh, when it comes to this premier event in the polis, policy wonkery calendar, uh, you feel a flood of joy that, that Policy Idol is back in the real world with requisite wine and snacks, a flesh and blood judging panel, scary, huh? Uh, and an audience, that's you, um, ready to holler and to whoop and to bellow, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hollering and whooping is definitely encouraged tonight. Um, so Policy Idol 2222 is back in the room and I'm delighted to be your host once again, as we scour the policy landscape for golden ideas, like, like detectorists searching for a lost hoard. The treasure we seek tonight has never been more valuable. The events of the last few years exposing and emphasizing the need for urgent answers to policy channels, challenges. Our world needs solutions, and that is what we are looking for this evening. My name is Mark Easton, and I, I, I work for the BBC, which means my evenings are often spent in a windowless room, head down, trying to make sense of the increasingly mad planet outside. Fortunately, there is very little news around at the moment, uh, and so I've been given a pass to join you all tonight uh, as we seek to crown the Policy Idol Champion 2022. Now, each of the finalists gathered here this evening will pitch their policy idea to you and also to our esteemed panel of judges. And what a panel we have, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they, may look, they may look benign, but don't be fooled. They take no prisoners when it comes to woolly thinking. They are pitiless in exposing those who didn't do their homework. Let me introduce you to them. Uh, on this end of the panel, we have Julia Gillard. And she knows a thing or two about how to put policy into action. She was in charge of Australia, uh, the 27th Prime Minister of that country and the first and only woman to serve in that role. Since leaving office, she's dedicated her time to advocacy, governance roles and writing. And Julia is the founder and inaugural chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at King's College and chair of its sister institute at the Australian National University. Welcome to Julia Gillard. <laughs> and, uh, and next to uh, Julia, we have Suzanne Hall. Suzanne is a qualitative, uh, qualitative that, I can never quite say it, it's got a lot of T's in it, researcher uh, with 20 years of public po policy uh, research experience. She actually led the qualitative team at Ipsos Mori from 2013, embedding innovative approaches to solving policy problems with a focus on deliberative, participatory, ethnographic, and digital methodologies. No idea. Anyway, brilliant to have you along, Suzanne. Thank you very much indeed. And at the end of the line, we have Dame Louise Casey, who's been various UK Prime Ministers' go-to policy guru, uh, homelessness, antisocial behaviour, troubled families, social cohesion, extremism, the police. Uh, Louise has shaped and continues to shape government uh, thinking. She's currently chair of the Institute of Global Homelessness and a visiting professor at the Policy Institute here at King's. Louise Casey, everybody. So... An all-female triumvirate tonight, because the two men who were due to be on the panel, that's Sunder Katwala and Bobby Duffy, have both succumbed to the COVID lurgy and are self-isolating. So best wishes to them and a, and a huge policy idol welcome to our wonderful, br brilliant panel. But they aren't the only judges tonight. You, ladies and gentlemen, you also have your say. 
We have seven pitches tonight, and after all seven have indeed pitched, I'm going to invite you to go online via the QR code thing. That, have you found them on your table? Yes, very straightforward. Uh, we're all very good at this since COVID, aren't we? I mean, we do it all the time. No, no contact. Um, and once you get on there, you can select your, your favourite policy. Don't do it yet. We'll do that when we've seen all seven. Um, and the presentation with the, uh, the most of your votes will win the prestigious audience prize. And um, so just a quick reminder of the... Have, have any of you uh, been here before? Is this your first time? Some of you have been... Well, let me introduce you. This is going to be great. Um, so <laughs> each idle team will pitch their policy idea against the clock. They have precisely three minutes to convince the judges who will mark their presentation on substance and on style. How well did they marshal the evidence to support their policy idea? How well would it work? And how well did they sell it? They have three minutes, as I say, go under, oh, that's wasted seconds, but go over and the judges may deduct marks. My assistant, Jack, has a new COVID-safe whistle. Jack, could you stand up with your whistle, please? It's a, it's a brand new one, no danger of any contamination. Uh, and he will blow his whistle at the, at the three-minute mark. Now, if... That's very good. Oh, and again. Thank you. Perfectly done. So that is what you need to listen for. That'll be three minutes. Now, if, if they are still going at three and a half minutes, however, a vat of ignominy will be tipped from a... You can't see it from where you are, but there's a trap door in the ceiling uh, as a tousle-haired clown jumps up and down and makes obscene hand gestures. We don't want that. So three and a half minutes, we don't want people to push it too far. There are four prizes, one award for the uh, presentation, one with the greatest substance, another award for the presentation uh, with the greatest style, and then there is your audience prize, and last but not least, of course, the overall winner, our Policy Idol 2022. So, it is time to have our first of seven presentations. Do, do please take notes so that when you get to, the, uh, get to the end of all seven, you can remember and you can, oh yeah, that was a, that was a three out of ten. Anyway, I'll leave it up to you to how you, uh, how you record these things. Uh, but the first, uh, the first pres presenter is here. So if I could ask Joyce to come and join me. Uh, thank you very much. Joyce. This is Joyce Jojan, have I yeah. got that right? Joyce is doing a BA in European politics, but has a policy proposal around the morning after pill. Jack, are you ready? Is your stopwatch poised? Uh, Joyce, you have three minutes starting... So, today I'm going to tell you a story. I have a friend, and her aunt Tracy was raped. But because she didn't get access to the morning after pill in time, she became a mother at 16. She didn't get to finish her education. She left school with no qualifications. And since then, she's had to work low-paid jobs her entire life to support herself and her family. The thing is, Tracy's story is not unusual. 45% of pregnancies every single year are unplanned. And when a third of sexually active women are having unprotected sex, and not always of their own choosing, we have a major problem on our hands. So, many of you may be asking, well, how can the morning after pill help with these issues? Well, if it's used correctly, the morning after pill will prevent about 84% of unintended pregnancies. But there is a catch. It has to be used within 72 hours of unprotected sex. And the sooner it is used, the more effective that it is. So time is a massive constraint here. Well, what is the problem? So the new price of the morning after pill is £10. But £10 is hardly pocket change, especially for a woman from a poorer background. But the thing is, she might have no other choice. You see, since the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Since the pandemic, access to the morning after pill became severely restricted, as about 77% of GPs either ended or limited their provision of contraceptive services. This left women in a really horrible bind, where they either had to pick between waiting for a morning after pill that was free from their local GP, 
that was less effective the longer they waited to take it, or they had to pay out of pocket for it themselves. And because of these issues I've just outlined, the morning after pill continues to be a widely underutilized resource. But it doesn't have to be. Making the morning after pill free will cost the UK government about 2.25 million pounds annually. But when you think about the 193 million pounds it's spent every single year on unintended pregnancies, it's hardly comparable. Ooh. Free over-the-counter access to the morning after pill is crucial. Not only because it prevents unintended pregnancies, but because by um, the quick interaction that a woman can have with a pharmacist, she can be guided into accessing long-term methods of contraception and also into getting an STI test after unprotected sex. This is especially beneficial for teenagers who are having sex for the first time, and they need to be guided on how to build healthy and safe sex practices that they need for life. Look. I'm not saying that the morning after pill is a miracle solution to all of these problems, but it will certainly make a difference. Thank you. Wow. Well, jo you, you've set the bar very high on the three minutes, I have to I'm say. Sorry. An impressive uh, presentation. The timing, absolutely uh, perfect. But I, I know that our, our panel of judges will have some questions for you. Each of the... Uh, each of the pitches will have be, be cross questioned for about six minutes or so. Um, so, Julia, do you want to start us off? I'm happy to start off. Uh, there's always a dilemma in public policy between free access and means testing. Why free, not means testing? Well, essentially, I think with the morning after pill, it's one of those things that even if it is £10, £10 is a lot of money for a lot of women. And especially if we're looking at income based. Uh, means testing, then um, I think that, sorry, I think that, um, yeah, when we're looking at income-based means testing, it does still alienate a large margin of women because the actual process of having to pay for money after, after pill itself is quite traumatic. Um, going to a GP or even going to, go to the, yeah, having to wait for a GP appointment or even having to go to a pharmacy to pay for one of these pills is quite a daunting experience because you feel like you've done something wrong, which is why you have to pay for it. Um, especially because it's only recently that the morning after pill has been reduced to 10 pounds. But before it used to be 30 pounds. So when you go to these GPs, you do feel like it's you're paying for doing something irresponsible when most of the time it can just be accidental. So I do feel like it's not, it's, it's about fairness and I don't think it's really fair to make a woman have to pay for something especially when it's not just a woman's responsibility for sex, it's also a man too. But again, she's the one having to take responsibility for it, and she's also the one who has to pay out of her own income to pay for a morning after pill. And I really don't think that is very fair. Suzanne. Thank you so much. Um, it was a really interesting presentation, not just because you kept it to time, but you presented <laughs> really, really well. Um, but one thing I did want to pick up, and you just alluded to it there, was, was you mentioned this is not just women's responsibility, but it's men's too. This policy proposal, while you made really clear what the, what the point of it was, still kind of leaves men out of the conversation. The onus and the responsibility is still on women to protect themselves and to look after their own health. Is there anything that your policy could do to bring men into the conversation and to encourage them to take responsibility? I think really education is key here. I know that there have been several initiatives by the UK government since, I think, from the Labour government, I think since 2000, because UK pregnancy rates, especially teenage pregnancy rates, are so high. So education has been really vital here. And I do think since that has happened, people have been, especially teenagers, been practicing safer sex. And uh, we have seen the consequences of that, the positive consequences, because there have been reduced teenage pregnancies over the last few years. But obviously I'm aware that education itself takes time and I think that you know, initiatives are starting to be taken into place where they are trying to develop male morning after pill, well not male morning after pills, but male co emergency contraceptions and male contraceptions that they can use long term, but this still takes time to develop and produce. So um, unfortunately I wish it could be a matter where women could just um, you know, where it wasn't just women taking responsibility for it, but I still think we're not quite there yet. And of course, more education, more sex-positive conversations can really help 
bring men into this as well, but it takes time. Louise. Um, I'm glad you said that uh, teenage pregnancies um, are reducing because the trend is in that direction after um, quite a lot of hard work from various organisations and actually getting a government to see that they had a role in that. So I think, um, which for decades, showing my age ever so slightly, um, governments on the whole don't ever want to interfere in family life when um, I think that's probably their first responsibility is to interfere in the safeguarding uh, of, of children and families. Um, really great presentation. I loved the fact that you went off on a personal um, connection. I thought that was very powerful. Um, and I think if you're doing a fundraising pitch, that would work brilliantly because you would, you're such a great presenter and I could feel a checkbook coming out to sort of... Do you know what checkbooks are? I'm just double-checking. There's a QR code that you put your phone at and I can get money off you. Um, there's something old called a checkbook where you have to write something. It's something called cash as well. I don't know whether you're keeping up, but anyway, uh, I do history. Um, I guess the thing I wanted to know is I was very interested in um, Julia's question about means testing versus free. I think that that's a huge policy uh, issue for people uh, when you're trying to weigh up what's the responsible way of using the tax payers' money. I think Suzanne is right to talk about uh, men in all of this, um, but I'm with you, which is I don't see that coming anytime soon. So I think we have to take action. We have our token man here this evening. <laughs> Uh, as the Home Affairs Just, just call me token, that's um, fine. <laughs> I, I suppose what I'm interested in is um, you know, kind of what evidence really about the wind... So in order to be completely convinced that actually I have to go to the Treasury and get some money for you to make this free, um, is that the issue or is the issue that the 72-hour window isn't met post-COVID by our GPs? Do you see what I'm saying? So why are we spending more money on something rather than improving the system that already exists, which is GPs need to reopen their doors or people should be able to go online and there should be no stigma attached to contraception or to the morning after pill. And if you start making it something that's over there, then I worry you stigmatise it. And, and I know that's the complete opposite of your intention. Okay. So I think in terms of... Well, first of all, the GPs, you said, um, you know, if it was possible to access within 72 hours, is it necessary? But the problem is that right, I've said that 84% of unintended pregnancies can be prevented if the emergency, emergency contraception pill is used within that time period. But the problem is that there is a vast difference between getting it within the first, you know, 12 to 24 hours versus getting it in the 72 hour period. Because in the first 12 to 24 hours, it's, I think, 95%. But then towards the end, it's about 58%. So that is a massive reduction in its efficacy. And I really don't think it's possible, especially with not just COVID, but over the last few years, we've seen that wait times for GPs appointments have been absolutely abysmal. It's been really busy. And it's actually quite expensive for a GP as well to provide these appointments. I mean, one GP appointment costs 30 pounds, but if a woman can get the, free, the morning after pill from the pharmacy instead, but it will cost so much less money for the GP because they don't need to dispense it when it's already being dispensed by the pharmacy. So in that way, there's a massive reduction of cost there as well, especially because it's really, like the pills themselves aren't actually that expensive. So I think that having that pressure alleviated off the GP itself is a massive game changer in terms of not only making the morning after pill more accessible because you don't have to book an appointment, you can just walk in to a boots, which is apparently 85% 80, about of the population is only 10 minutes away. But with a GP, you can't necessarily always do that. It's not that accessible. So that's why I think it's really important that we can you know, not only alleviate that pressure on the GP, but also make it that much more accessible for the women who need it. So I think from a, a former government perspective, I would say that's an incredibly powerful argument. Mm. So the argument is, if it's cheaper and more accessible to make it free via uh, pharmacies, job done. Mm. If it's about making GPs more effective, that's a different issue. So I think, um, I, I, I suppose I've still got a slight, uh, kind of, I, I'd want to see that proven before I'd be able to go off to the Treasury and suggest that they uh, spend money on it. But it's a very coherent argument, that last one. Thanks. Can, can I ask a, a, a quick question? So I'm just thinking how journalists might respond to this proposal. <laughs> uh, 
I think you might get quite a lot of pushback from certain faith communities, for yeah. instance. And I also think that giving people free stuff, actually, you might actually, I mean, the argument would be that you would then have people, you know, sort of just stocking up on these things, you know, and unnecessarily. And actually, that could be problematic, too. So just your thoughts on how you might ensure that you know the, 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 the message you want to get across does get across and that people use this responsibly and, and that, uh, you know, that it, it can it can become a policy I guess I think first off in terms of faith groups uh, I know Jacob Rees Morg actually when the 10 pound uh, reduction was introduced he said oh but it's an abortion pill and there was a lot of pushback against that because it isn't an abortion pill all it does is it delays ovulation so it's yeah it prevents like it delays the releasing of an egg so I think if that was really heavily marketized, then you know, I think it's not really fair for one person like Jacob Rees Morg to make that kind of statement um, and just expect everyone to believe it, because it's not true. But I think that in terms of faith as well, it's not really fair that one person like I'm a Christian myself, and I think if I put on my individual beliefs and you know, opinions onto a whole group of people who need it, it would be incredibly unfair. And I think that we have to, even though I know that there's a certain amount of pushback there, I think that is something that we have to put at the forefront, that facts such as the, the morning after pill only delays ovulation needs to come at the forefront. And I do yeah. think it's one of those myths that's associated with it as well. But yeah, I think when you said about um, in terms of um, people just stockpiling. Yeah. Um, just briefly, if you would. Yeah. yeah, no, of course. I think that, well, at, when they did studies on it, they found that actually women ca actually were more likely to access long-term methods of contraception instead because that was the sort of belief, oh, you know, if we make this pill free, then people are just going to misuse it and overuse it. But actually, I think it promoted more sexual well-being because this, especially with a conversation with a pharmacist, if they guide them to say, look, this pill is not effective for, as a long-term method, but if you use a longer-term acting method of contraception, then actually you're going to be safer. And people do tend to follow that. Studies have shown that that has been a very effective route. So actually this whole misuse propaganda is very inaccurate okay. and it's been used for years to, to All keep right. it. All right, a, a nice fantastic pitch. I know the judges were very impressed. Our first Thank pitch you. tonight from Joyce Jojan. Right, well, that, that, gives you a, that gives you an idea of the, the intensity of what's going to be happening up here. Uh, our second pitch comes from a trio. Uh, yes, please do come up. Uh, we have uh, Aditi Mudgar. Um, which one are you? Aditi? There. Uh, Francis Weston. That's you. And Karen Demko. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're all medical students. But you want to talk to us about traffic lights. <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, you have three minutes. And it starts now. There are currently 14.1 million people in the UK living with an impairment or disability, with the most commonly reported being those that affect mobility. This accounts for nearly one in two UK households. Yet despite this high number, there is no standardised system or central source of reliable information for assessing venue accessibility. Imagine this. Every time you decide to walk into a building, walk or go into a building, the first thing that crosses your mind is will I even be able to get through the door, let alone will I like it here or be able to move around here. In fact, three quarters of disabled people have had to leave a business or a shop because of accessibility issues. Part of this problem is because venues, whether it be a business or a shop, don't understand what accessibility truly means. Therefore, our policy proposal is a mandatory standardised accessibility assessment for venues, the results of which will be displayed with a traffic light system to increase ease of living for those with a disability while also making institutions more transparent and accountable with the information and experience they provide to their disabled customers. In this way, we'll prevent unnecessary day-to-day -day challenges faced currently by the disabled community. The results of the accessibility assessment would be made available as a sticker near the entrance to the venue and on the government and venue websites. The criteria for the different classifications would be created by professionals in the area with input from people with disabilities. This criteria would not be shared with the venues until the ratings are provided. 
Self-reporting questionnaires would be sent out to the venues so that accessibility data can be collected and turned into ratings. If the information shared would not be satisfactory, an assessor would be asked to complete the assessment. And the likely cost of such an in-person assessment would only be £21 based on existing examples. Hence, this would be a mandatory self-assessed but audited scheme at low cost to the government. This type of assessment is currently being used by the government to carry out the fire risk assessment, which shows the potential of this policy to be successful. The impact of our policy would be huge for businesses, the disabled community, and for most of you all sitting in this room today. How, you may ask? That is because 50% of people above the age of 65 develop evidence of osteoarthritis, most commonly in the knee, and so will have some form of accessibility needs. Our measure will make it easier for disabled people to know what to expect and to plan their day accordingly. They will feel more confident to go out and socialize, which is particularly important since disabled people report feeling lonely four times more than non-disabled people. And this is likely only increased due to the pandemic. Businesses could also receive a potential economic boost of 2.74 billion pounds per year, which they are currently missing out on due to issues with accessibility. Thank you for your time, and we will leave you to have a look at some target audience feedback which we have received. Pretty good on the timing too. I think it's going to be one of those evenings. Um, thank you very much indeed for your fascinating presentation. Suzanne. Um, I think one of the questions I wanted to ask is around how do you encourage businesses who are rated C or venues that are rated C to move up the scale? What kind of sanctions would be in place or would you have any support for them to, to change things? Or is there, what, what measures would go alongside that rating? I think one of the main things we would do is we would give them a six month or one year period to have the opportunity to increase their rating. So it's not like after the initial assessment you will get a sticker that's going to go on your shop front forever. So they will have the opportunity to make that changes. And then again, it will be reviewed with every certain number of years. So again, there is a huge scope for improvement. And we would try and make the ratings and the criteria as realistic as possible. So simple things like just the inclusion of a handrail in the bathroom, or maybe having an alarm in case someone falls down, portable ramps, these kind of things. We would have a huge emphasis on that. Um, if, for example, a building is very small, we're not expecting them to tear it down and build a new one so that they can have a bigger toilet. Like, I guess that's not realistic. Um, and so they might receive a lower rating, but we will try and aim that a lot of our ratings will be achievable um, across many different buildings and venues. Yeah, I think the other important point as well is kind of the economic boost that businesses mm -hmm. can have. You know, by improving their facilities, they're going to increase the footfall of people in and out of that building. You know considering the high numbers of people that are living with a disability currently in the UK, you know, it's just going to provide a lot more of those people with opportunity and chance to be able to visit these venues. Louise. Um, just, I mean, I think this is a fantastic idea, you know, incidentally, and one of those that you think, why has nobody thought of that before, which is what is so brilliant about Policy Idol uh, as, as, as something that I found I find fascinating and stimulating every year um, and you know the, the, the last one and this one and most of them actually fit into that category. Um, I guess my initial question is can you prove to me why you can you know uh, uh, the 2.7 million I, I find those figures often are bandied around and I think of people that work in the treasury and think they get nowhere so so that's one sorry to be brutal but that's no, no, the truth of the matter so we just all this cost benefit stuff is often nonsense um sorry that was a bit too brutal that's not <laughs> nonsense that's probably very thought through but from a government perspective people use expressions like that all the time and they don't get any further than the soundbite if you if you see what I mean so I, I just wanted to ask about that the, the other thing, sorry, because I, um, I, can, I can see we've got a very firm chair this evening in Mr. Easton. Um, the, uh, the other thing I want to, is uh, really taken actually by the target audience feedback. And I, and I wondered, I've often wondered actually why we treat people with physical disabilities so badly 
um, it's so badly uh, in, in this country and a sense that you have rightly said as we move through the decades, and I'm nowhere near that yet, everyone, uh, as we move through the decades and we head into our 60s and 70s, we do all develop uh, mobility issues. And I wondered, so one, I wanted to be a bit tough about the money. And then secondly, I wanted to ask uh, kind of what, what did you do around that feedback and why, as certainly at face value, and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, you are all able-bodied and what took you to a point that you wanted to look at something for people that aren't able-bodied? Three questions. No, of course, yeah. I, I can, quite start, a lot of questions. <laughs> I can start it off, but please remind, let me know if I've forgotten something. Um, so we've made a list of sources just so you can see where we've kind of got our statistics from. So the original uh, the statistics that I gave about the three quarters of people having had to leave the venue because of disability issues, and also the 2.74 billion that Aditi mentioned. So these were taken from the Office of National Statistics and a UK disability survey, survey research report, which are both done by the government. So we kind of hope that those would be the most accurate sources because we do understand that numbers are often thrown around. Um, and then there were also, um, in terms of the low economic cost of implementation. We took those from the fire risk assessment and also from the current food hygiene rating system, um, which are both kind of similar schemes and both done at very low cost to the government. Um, and then the kind of my reason and personally for um, this proposal is that quite a few family friends are, have mobility impairments, so they're even wheelchairs or use walking sticks. And also, my brother is currently um, has an impairment and really struggles to move around. And I think that all of those kind of examples, I've, I've seen this happening before, and it's kind of every day, everywhere. And even from researching this project, you know, now every time I go into a building, I think, oh, if I weren't able-bodied, would I be able to do this? Yeah. And a lot of the time, I wouldn't. Okay, so I'm going to move after that. Um, so, with reference to the figure of 2.74 billion that they're missing out on. I think that ties in nicely with the figure that three quarters of people do turn up to shops or restaurants and they have to turn back and go away because they can't get in. That was the initial figure we had. And actually, Frances was saying she has personal experience of this on a holiday, that you go to places, you realize there's no ramp or there's a ton of stairs, and so you just have to turn back. And so I think that's where the money that they are losing out on is that there are a lot of potential customers who have to turn away. Um, I think from the perspective of the government, the scheme would also generate economic activity. So for example, if a venue receives a C rating and they want to install a handrail, they want to do things, they're going to be employing people to come in, make those adjustments. And so again, I think it would be beneficial for the government. It's generating employment potentially or economic activity, people coming in, building work, construction possibly. And for the reason, like as us three, able-bodied people choosing this topic, um, we are medical students and we go on placement to hospitals. This year we did a block in geriatrics and aging. And so some of the things we do is we help the patients go to the bathroom, for example, if the nurse is busy. And these experiences just make us realize how difficult it can be as an older person to move around and how they need our help. Um, it's so rewarding for us as medical students when we can help out in a small way. And so we wanted to take it a step further and see what else we can do with our experiences. Julia. Well, thank you so much for all the explanation. And that was a very powerful sharing of your motivations in this proposal. I wanted to um, ask about the policy design. You've gone for the option of regulating and making this compulsory. Another way of doing it would have been to create incentives for businesses to get into the system, so to make it a self-regulation matter rather than a compulsory regulation matter, so businesses could distinguish themselves by having a certificate that showed that they were very uh, disability friendly. Do you think there might be merit in starting with that and seeing how much opt-in you get? And if you get a lot, then you don't need the regulatory approach. There's obviously a lot of political debates that get triggered about the amount of regulation businesses, and particularly small businesses, have to comply with. I mean, our original thought process was to kind of start out with bigger institutions, because of course it would be, you know, if you're kind of trying to cover every single venue in the whole of the UK, that's a very big task. 
So I thought kind of as a pilot scheme, you could start out with kind of big corporations, big bus businesses or chain restaurants or retail, um, yeah, peak in retail, um, and then see how that works out. But I think the key point kind of, of our presentation is that it's a standardized system. And the issue at the moment is that there's no standardization um, for these for um, mobility and disability. And one more thing, I think I think an opt-in system does sound good, but the, the truth is right now businesses have so much on their minds. They're still recovering from COVID. There are a lot of challenges that they're dealing with. So I think it would be unlikely they would go for this as soon as we would like it. And we would want this to be sooner rather than later because people are suffering now. People are suffering every day today. They're missing out on events. They might feel like a burden because they're getting turned away. Um, and so we wanted to make a change as soon as possible, and we thought that while an opt-in system does sound great, it's unlikely to be a priority right now with the social climate, especially now again with Ukraine and you know, every, all the costs are going up um, of gas, transportation, so this is going to impact businesses. So it's unlikely they would want to do this now, but we think this should be done sooner rather than later. There was a, I think the law passed in 2010 um, saying it's our moral duty as a society to help disabled people and for there to be quality of access. And so, you know, 10 years on, I'm mean, sorry, 12 years on, I think we really want to do this now and that's why it's not an option. Well, those are very, very clear uh, answers to some quite tricky questions. Uh, thank you to our trio, that's to Aditi, Francis, and to Corin. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> As I, was, um, as I was saying earlier, do, do remember to jot down your thoughts now because you, you, you will be racking your brains when we come to the end of all seven. Our third pitch uh, this evening comes from another medical student, James Madden. Uh, James, do come up. Um, James is pitching what he calls the Medical Students for End of Life Care Initiative. James, you've got three minutes on that starting now. Right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's James, and this is my pitch for the Medical Students for End of Life Care Initiative. Um, I'm not sure if you have any experience of being in hospital, but they're not particularly pleasant or relaxing places to be. Uh, they're noisy and confusing and intimidating. And if you're admitted, lots of things can happen that make you feel scared and confused. Um, all of these feelings are orders of magnitude greater for someone in the last days of their life. And it's a very sad truth that a great number of people die in UK hospitals uh, feeling isolated and away from their families. Um, so to give you a real life example of this, uh, this is the case of Mr. C, a 74 year old gentleman who was admitted after four days of severe abdominal pain and vomiting. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer on his second day in hospital and he was given no pain relief for the last three days of his life. He was given oral painkillers despite the fact that he couldn't swallow and he passed away uh, on his fifth day in hospital in tremendous pain. Mr. C is unfortunately just one of the quarter of a million patients who die every year in hospitals in the UK, um, one of whom died in uh, particularly appalling and inhumane circumstances, suffering not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. Uh, as, as we go on, cases like his are likely to become more frequent, not just because of acute pressures like COVID, but uh, the growing number of elderly people we have in this country. And it's cases like his that really demonstrate how important it is that the health system continues to make sure that its services are as good as possible, so that every patient receives a quality of care that befits a modern NHS. So what can we do about it? Well, an audit is a data gathering procedure that examines clinical practice and improves the quality of end of life care. Uh, following recommendations from the National Audit for Care at the End of Life, the Care Quality Commission and the End of Life Care Audit from 2016, uh, we aim to increase the number of audits and quality improvement projects that happen in palliative care departments by organizing a national consortium of medical student societies whose role it is to help their local teaching hospitals undertake these projects. And the aim would be to uh, improve adherence to the, the standard set by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or the NICE guidelines. Medical students are capable, experienced, and enthusiastic about taking part in such projects. Uh, they come at a lower cost, um, lower a physical cost, but also a lower opportunity cost than working doctors and consultants. They become part of the healthcare system that then improves itself, so that uh, quality improvement becomes instantiated within the healthcare system. 
They also become advocates for better deaths and uh, are actively working to solve problems for their dying patients. Projects like this, by the way, are already underway in many other areas, such as psychiatry, surgery, and neurology. Uh, so thank you all for your time, and I will leave you with these testimonials that we've had from doctors and students. Thank you very much. Well, they, they've already really nailed the three-minute thing, yet again, right on, yeah. the, uh, on the buzzer. Uh, yeah. Well done, James. Um, Mel C, I saw up there. I, I think uh, that's short for yeah. uh, medical student for end of life. Anyway, that's exactly. um, <laughs> uh, Louise. Um, so, are these a thing at the moment? Do medical students actually do this in trusts at the moment and in hospitals? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, like in King's, as well as many other medical schools throughout the country, it's actually a mandatory part of the curriculum. The students undertake a quality improvement project. Um, I myself have been a part of a, a two national initiatives in neurology and um, an audit that we did for the urology surgery department at King's College Hospital. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's extremely common, excuse me, that medical students take part in this sort of project. James, can I ask a, a somewhat more challenging question sure. then as a, as a medic that's involved in this? It's like, why are we still having to do audits to get this right? And are you essentially giving a hospital pass, pun deliberately intended, to essentially allow the system to carry on failing people at their end of year, uh, at their end of life. So um, my father was 73, went to a hospital and died in exactly the circumstances you have just, um, you've just outlined, that he I'm died in pain um, and had cancer. And so it, for families, you're thinking, this is just shite medicine. Like these are doctors and nurses getting something wrong, even though I want to put doctors and nurses on the highest pedestal in public service in life. But in some cases, they just plain get it wrong. So why are we getting this wrong? And you know, why, how is an audit, which feels a very bureaucratic process, going to improve the end of life for your Mr. C, yeah. who is a true person, because he would have been Mr. Casey? Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry about what happened to your yeah, father. Yeah, it's all right. Um, I, I myself have had similar experiences with, with relatives dying in hospital. So, um, and so it's, it's sort of a big question. Um, and it's, it's very reasonable to say, okay, well, how, how is it that an audit can improve the quality of patient care? Um, and I think there's two things to bear in mind when you're sort of trying to demonstrate. The first is that you can't improve what you don't measure. Okay? So you know, any, anything that you're trying to improve, you need to know how it's currently performing. And that's exactly what an audit is. So any, any type of data gathering procedure to see, okay, well maybe how long are patients staying in hospital before they pass away? Are they given opportunities to discuss their mental health and their financial worries and things like that? You can look at the percentages of patients who are given those opportunities. Um, and then you can sort of intervene and try and improve them and then you audit again to see if it's worked. So that's the rationale behind it and that's, um, that's sort of the way that it improves care, just as a measuring tool. Um, was, was there a second part to your question? Sorry, has, has that No, no, that's fine. Uh, just coming back on that, though, mm. um, isn't this about um, the monitoring and the management of practice um, as a, on individual basis, mm. as opposed to auditing? So does your audit, so the problem for people like Mr. C isn't that he needs a mental health issue or the, He's got some financial problems. Um, yeah. I get tougher as the evening goes on, so forgive me, James. I'm, I'm zeroing no, in on a, a, a tougher way, true. but these are the questions you will be asked if you were actually trying to get somebody to fund this Absolutely. or do it. But actually, it isn't part of this that actually that we're just not getting the supervision of doctors and nurses right when it comes to people's end of care, because it end of life, because it doesn't have the same um, importance as diagnosing somebody mm. with a particular type of cancer. So we value it less, as a, a, and your process is just putting a bureaucratic process in place rather than zeroing in on performance and decisions. Yeah. So um, I'm actually going to disagree with your uh, okay, with cool. your connotation that it's a, a purely bureaucratic process. Mm -hmm. um, so the term audit, sort of in a clinical setting, typically means the thing I described with a two-stage monitoring procedure. But there's also an intervention involved in it. So. Um, I can give you an example, the one uh, that I worked on personally. Uh, we sort of removed two blood tests from the preoperative surgical checklist that weren't doing anything, that weren't helping any patients. 
and uh, we ended up saving two and a half thousand pounds for the department over the next year that went directly back into improving uh, the, the tools that surgeons use. And that had a direct impact on the quality of patient care. So um, I do think, I don't think it's purely bureaucratic process. Obviously there is bureaucracy involved, you know, we're dealing with the NHS, but uh, there, is, there is practical, practical help involved. Um, and, you know, as, as regards to whether we're addressing the point directly, that, uh, that depends what the audit's on. Um, we've, you know, been talking to a number of, of palliative care doctors, uh, both at King's and at different hospitals, and um, they have brought up both systemic issues that seem to be affecting a great number of hospitals across the country, but also individual problems with those hospitals. And this is exactly the type of thing that, uh, the type of problem that Melk is designed to solve. So, so great answers, that. great presentation, and thank you for letting me be tough with you. It's oh, brilliant. no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we expect, Louise. Uh, Julia. Thank you, and, and thank you for the answers to those questions. I'm wondering about the experience from uh, the other end, which is the medical students who are involved in this. Um, so presumably that means they're in uh, close contact with a dying person, which, um, uh, you know, if you're not prepared for it or haven't had much experience uh, with that, obviously has a sense of potential trauma associated with it. And then I'm wondering, given uh, in the hierarchy and, you know, hospitals, NHS tend to be very hierarchical, how empowered that person is or how much pressure they might feel under if they're trying to shine a light on something that's going wrong? You know, does that put them in an invidious position where, you know, the very people who may help their career prosper later on are the ones that they're going to have to say, you didn't do this or you did do that or why isn't this happening better? That's a, that's a very real concern. Um, and the main thing to realise is that with projects like this, it's never the students, it's never anyone doing it on their own, either the students or any doctors who are trying to make change. So uh, the medical students we've contacted, these figures, by the way, are a little bit out of date. It's actually 52 medical students from 10 societies that we've got as of today. So. Um, there, they would be working as part of a team of other medical students who were supervised by ideally two doctors, but almost definitely a consultant. So um, a very senior doctor with um, you know, tremendous experience and who can sort of deal with any potential conflicts that might arise as a result of that. Um, and then the other thing to bear in mind is that we've had a, a tremendous response from a wide variety of years of medical students. So from second years right the way up to fifth years and who are about to graduate. Um, so whether they have any contact with, directly with people who are dying, any potentially traumatic experiences, um, you know, there's enough, enough students working on, on projects that that can be a, a personal choice that they make. If they're younger year medical students who might want to just, you know, sort of observe and, and take things a little bit lighter, then they have the choice to do that. And then if they have training in how to deal with patients who are dying, if they're in four or four, fourth or fifth year, they, they would have the option to do that. So. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Suzanne. Thank you. It was a really good presentation and such a live, pressing issue yeah. as well at the moment. So mm -hmm. really great that you that you tackled something so complex and so so tricky. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is is and I'm actually working with Catherine uh, Sleeman at the minute on this is you know oh, right. end, end of life care is such a personal mm. issue as well and everyone's idea of a good end of life. Yeah. is very, very different, and, and no one imagines or wants to imagine it being in a hospital, but, but how, how do you begin to evaluate something like this? How do you build in the family perspective, the patient perspective, to what those audits were like? It's, mm. it's more than just kind of mo numbers and monitoring. It's, it's very personal, experiential data, and I was just wondering if you've thought about how you kind of gather that to, to, to complement the monitoring that you've yeah. talked about. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, obviously... With palliative care especially, like you say, there's a lot more qualitative data that, as opposed to just, you know, the pure numbers and everything like you mentioned. Um, and the, the main way that this is sort of tackled with data is uh, it's very, very common in the NHS to do something called PROMS, which is patient reported outcome measures. Um, they're sort of qualitative, more qualitatively designed surveys that measure patients' experience of care as opposed to just okay, they were in hospital for this long, they received these medications, et cetera. It's more like, okay, well, how, how did you experience this care? Do you feel supported by your consultant? Do you feel supported by the nursing staff and that sort of thing? Um, so 
that's, that's obviously a very tricky line to balance, but it can be done. Um, and it's certainly not the case that an audit is never done with purely qualitative data. You can have qualitative audit. It just makes the uh, statistical analysis a little bit more difficult. Um, and you have to sort of end up relying on more narrative-driven cases, but that also can be done as well. I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Um, well, what high standard is being set tonight? Right. Number three, James Madden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have um, number four, another trio for you. Could I welcome up Emma Forside, Andrea Tonone, and Sophia Kavanagh? And uh, our trio, they're undergrads studying history and political economy uh, with an interest in a piece of legislation they call the Sex Work Reform Act. You have three minutes to convince us on that, starting now. The market for sex work exists, and it is not going away. Demand for sex work in the UK more than quadrupled since 1990. Yet these workers remain one of our most vulnerable demographics. Despite suffering a mortality rate 12 times higher than average, sex workers are becoming increasingly fearful of relying on the authorities designed to protect us. The criminalization of sex work further stigmatizes these workers, forcing the industry underground, exposing them to rampant, unreported violence and human trafficking. So it is our responsibility to protect them. UK policy currently contains a number of contradictions. The actual buying and selling of sex itself is legal, but all associated practices of sex work has been criminalized. As Sophia mentioned, this does nothing to reduce the demand for sex work. However, these policies do not provide adequate protections for workers themselves. Therefore, our policy would decriminalize associated practices of sex work, such as brothel keeping and loitering, in order to facilitate safer conditions for workers. Allowing workers to register as self-employed would give them better bargaining power and access to individual agency, which other UK industries enjoy. Furthermore, striking criminal records and expanding the use of engagement and support orders is necessary in order to facilitate workers who wish to exit the industry. These policies have been advocated for by national and international organizations. Their research has shown that these actions are necessary in order to lessen fears of unfair criminalization and provide support systems that these workers desperately need. Thank you, Emma. Several scholars may disagree with this type of policy because they believe it would increase the size of the sex industry. However, New Zealand has managed to create um, the Prostitution Reform Act and do criminalize sex work. The number of sex workers has fallen across the country, and New Zealand has created better conditions for workers, thus increasing their wages. Sex workers now are more willing to report and work with authorities. The cost. Our policy will not ask the government for more money. Our reform will bring money to the state. How? Decriminalizing sex work will create savings for our health and police services. And most of all, our policy will move the underground economy controlled by organi criminal organizations to the state. This is how we'll bring more money to the state. The notion of criminalized sex work is based on the idea that it would stop exploitation within the sex industry. But our research proves the contrary. By addressing current policy contradictions, our policy will tackle criminal activity, improve worker safety, and be the first step towards the real structural change we need to see. Sex workers are not a subordinate subsection of society. They are workers. They deserve the rights we all enjoy, and they deserve the respect and protections that we receive every day. Thank you. Well done, well done. Oh, yeah. how, how many seconds did they have to spare? Four seconds, that's still pretty good, pretty good. Uh, well done, all of you. Um, I think it's uh, Julia to go first. Uh, very well done. We should be doing uh, bonuses or something for going uh, four seconds under. That's fantastic. Uh, short and sharp. So that was a great presentation. Um, and I think uh, this is an area that's been debated over many years, and I think so many of the arguments you put are um, clearly uh, the right arguments. But where this sort of policy reform ends up foundering is in the court of public opinion. So, um, you know, uh, brave politicians propose it, uh, and then there's a lot of pushback from, I mean, people from all sorts of perspectives, obviously, people who have got a um, 
uh, moral attitude towards sex work and think that this will encourage sex work even though the statistics show that's not true. Um, people who uh, worry that if there's um, an absence of um, regulation, uh, legislation, then sex work will flourish in their suburb, in their street. They don't want, um, you know, a brothel opening in their um, neighbourhood high street or whatever. Um, those sorts of concerns that it's, you know, poor role modelling for children, you know, the list goes on. Um, so I'm, I'm really inviting you to imagine the worst Daily Mail headline about this, um, you know, waking up uh, the day before the vote in Parliament and there is the worst possible Daily Mail headline. Like, how do you deal with that? How do you win public opinion? So thank you for the question. So we have to think, as Sophia mentioned, that this market exists and it doesn't, it doesn't go away. The other possibility, it would be, for example, maybe the Nordic model, but which is not a solution, as many international domestic organizations have stated. It's harmful to sex workers and to society as a whole. For, and this has been stated by Amnesty, Amnesty International, the WHO, and the UK's NHS. It's, not, it's harmful for several reasons. The first one, for example, is it doesn't give access to sex workers to health and, um, and care programs in general. And because they don't have the protection from the state, uh, they, don't, um, they are pushed towards criminal activities. Um, so the answer that I would give to the Meridale, it, it would be um, that, again, this market exists. It's not going away. We have to give the same dignity and rights as any other workers, because those people are workers. They work as in any other industry. They just need protection from the state in order to create this umbrella of labor unions, charities working together with, with pub public and private actors. And um, maybe you were asking something. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to add, you briefly mentioned specific groups, say religious groups, pushing back on this. I think that it's important to note that what we're discussing is actually the harm coming to vulnerable demographics. And I think that no matter your background, we can all be unified by the fact that we don't want to see vulnerable people being harmed physically, mentally, all of these things. And I think that that's something we can be unified by, right? And our policy would help these people in these situations. It's also important to note that we will have freedom of association and thus freedom of disassociation. By embracing the decriminalization of sex work, we're not saying that everybody suddenly has to embrace the industry, become a part of it. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying that it's not something that goes away. So we might as well make it safe for these workers because we all want to live in a safe, happy community. And that is one way to do that. And if I could add, um, my response to that would be that a lot of policy currently puts a lot of blame onto workers themselves. Like Sophia mentioned, these are marginalized groups of people who they need protection. Um, current statistics show that about 11% of men, I believe it's age 16 to 57 in the UK, have paid for sex always once in their life. And again, this isn't a demand that's been reduced, even with the UK partially criminalizing sex work. Uh, we've seen cases in Ireland and Northern Ireland where sex work has been fully criminalized. And in some cases, advertisement for prostitution actually increased. So again, this isn't a market that's just going to dissipate on its own. And the best way that we believe to address this is by providing further agency and protections for workers themselves. Suzanne. New Zealand data is so striking, and, and you work with those kind of international examples really well. Um, one of the points you made, though, was decriminalizing will empower sex workers to interact with authorities more than, more than they do at the minute, um, around with law enforcement, with health, with NGOs. I think the challenge I would put back, perhaps, is that legislative change doesn't always go hand in hand with behavior change, and there's perhaps cultural issues that, are, that, that come into play there as well. So how would you, what else needs to be done to, to support that interaction, to encourage sex, work, sex workers to, to go forward and, and interact with those institutions? So um, one thing that we have found in our data is, you're right, there's a huge culture of stigmatization against workers themselves. But a big thing that adds to this is the fact that there's very little comprehensive policy, especially for police in dealing with sex workers. So for example, the NPCC has published guidelines on how to deal with sex workers as victims and marginalized groups, not as criminals. 
but in a Leeds University survey, about 86% of police officers weren't aware of the existence of these guidelines. So I do think that change, as we've seen, does need to come to an extent from top down. This isn't something that's gonna change culture overnight, but this is a way of helping sex workers themselves feel a lot safer and more confident in approaching authorities and using health services and in bettering lives for themselves. Yeah, and also uh, we may add that um, from the example of New Zealand, uh, when the Prostitution Reform Act was ratified in 2003, in just three years, the, the behavior, the cultural behavior, behavior has changed and did change. Um, and one of the reasons was it was like a dominant effect. The in decriminalizing sex work, they also liberalized at the same time the creation of labor unions for sex workers. And so they created this umbrella of protection under, again, labor unions and other NGOs and charities. And this created that environment where sex workers could feel safe and protected, and also they could trust more authorities in order to collaborate with uh, health organizations or police services. And, uh, and, and at the same time, it did um, create uh, not just a political legal change, but a cultural change as a whole in a matter of three years. And that is incredibly impressive, mm. yeah. To summarize, it's just a case of policy being a brilliant first step. When you make a policy change, it starts conversations, it makes people realize that an issue is prevalent in our society. So yeah, as we mentioned in our speech, it isn't exactly going to solve the issue overnight. It isn't the only thing that needs to be done, but it is definitely an excellent first step in the right direction. Louise. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a really uh, great presentation and on a, um, a really, really difficult policy area for governments um, uh, in part because of what Julia said about the court of public opinion and the, the heading into that territory being so tricky and not always a vote winner um, and a vote loser and therefore people don't always do brave and the right things. I suppose there are two things I was thinking about when I read this earlier. Um, essentially the fact that women are criminalised by this process is just morally reprehensible in the 21st century. It's sort of, it just beyond me that we, we put the onus on the woman who is selling her sex essentially as a criminal offence and that there's no discourse about why men buy women's bodies and buy them basically. And for me, it's an extension of uh, wider abuse and misogyny within society. Um, and, and so I, I wonder partly where this particular act would focus on, I have a problem with the expression violence against women and girls because most of the time it's actually male violence against women and girls and actually women and children uh, to be even more accurate about it because young boys are as at risk of uh, child sex abuse uh, from their parents and so on as, as, as girls. So I think we get some of this stuff wrong, actually, more broadly in the public and policy and political discourse. And I think where you've zeroed in is on this real policy dilemma, actually, between you know something that's seen as terribly simplistic between decriminalization, i.e. there's nothing wrong with selling your body to a man for sex, with at the same time making that a criminal offense. And I think what I was struck by is actually a lot of women who are sex workers have no choice, that they are endemically poor, that their uh, educational attainment is low, that their value in themselves as women is low. Um, and that, that, you know, I'm speaking from uh, you know, evidence, and I wondered where that came, really. It, that, that, you know, for me, it's not just about making them self-employed workers. For me, it's about liberating them to be equal women in society along with others. And I didn't feel that that came out. Um, but I know it's in there because of the way that you've delivered it. I just wondered where that was, really. And as you can see from the way that we've reacted to this, this is, this is as old as human beings, uh, the transaction with women uh, for sex. Um, and that it's actually about power in society and the difference between a woman's power and more often than not a man's power. And that if we don't see it within that framework, then we will let down an awful lot of women who actually need to have better support, better help, better education, more liberation and more respect 
from society than they currently enjoy. There was a question in there somewhere. There was. The, 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 the question is, did you think about that side of it? Because there's this sense, isn't there, in the public, oh, you know, they can all be self-employed workers, this is an equal playing field. Like, going out to sell my body tonight in, in what used to be King's Cross is the same as being a barista. Well, it's not. Right. You know, being a barista is not the same as a woman from a very poor background, often in abusive relationships, quite often to have suffered abuse. That's why she's a sex worker. And you can't right. ignore that when you're wanting governments to pass Sex Work Act. Yes. And that is absolutely true. A big reason why a lot of women stay in sex work is because they don't have a lot of choice about it. That's so if Andrea could go back to the policy slide. Yes. There we go. So one really big issue here is that criminalizing sex work creates a cycle of fines. So one way that the Crown Prosecu Prosecution Service recommends dealing with the prosecution of sex workers is by giving them a fine for repeated offenses of things like loitering. And in order to pay off these fines, most women have to resort to, resort to more sex work. So this is why striking criminal records is extremely important. And also why engagement and support orders, having rehabilitation programs for alcohol use, drug use, for support services is very necessary. And again, back to criminal records, when people have loitering offenses on their records, they are very unlikely to be able to find a job outside of sex work. This is something that limits opportunity. And this is why this aspect is extremely important. Additionally, one issue around brothel keeping in particular is that there is currently no statutory definition of what a brothel is. It's only been established in the court case Stevens v. Christie in 1987 as a place where two or more sex workers are working out of. And so this is a huge problem in itself in that sex workers cannot work together for fears of criminalization. This isolates a lot of workers themselves, and this puts a lot of emphasis on workers themselves being the criminals here. And I hope that answers your question as to why these processes of decriminalization are extremely important in creating further agency and further choice for these people themselves. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. So this is your, this is number why, four on the song sheet. Emma, Andrea, and Sophia. Uh, thank you very much for this. Which means, which means that we are racing towards number five now. Uh, another trio, the rule of three. Samuel, Remy Akinwale, Alia Rahman, and Lawrence Mills. Uh, are they there? Are they, are they changing microphones? Have you, are you ready, gentlemen? Splendid, uh, splendid quality of, uh, of uh, presentations we've had this evening. I think really impressive. Are you ready, gents? Do come up. We've got Samuel, we've got Olya, and we've got Lawrence. Uh, give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> They're studying politics, all studying politics, I think. Uh, but you're going to talk about men's mental health. Uh, you've got three minutes on that subject, starting now. Tough enough. We don't talk about that. The sad reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that these are daily conversations that men have with themselves every single day. Suicide is the biggest killer in men under 50 years old, and men are three times more likely to commit suicide than their female counterparts. Now, I'd like you to just take a look around you right now. Take a look at the people on your table. One in four people on your table and in this room have reported mental health issues just within the last year alone. And we think this has become further exacerbated through COVID-19. So, why is this happening? Three reasons. A lack of emotional literacy, social norms and stigma, and lack of access to help within the community. So our policy today is for mandatory mental health messaging and a 60-second education segment for all live sports broadcasts in the UK. Now, this has two new proposals. Firstly, is a graphic overlay, such as a drop-down from the game clock, and this is to encourage mental health awareness and a call to action. And the second part is that we want to get presenters to educate about mental health for 60 seconds. And here is a sample of how that may look. Now, we want to implement this through a pilot project of the BBC's coverage of the 2022 World Cup. This is going to have millions of viewers, and a recent survey found that 68% of men asked intend to watch. Now, the World Cup in Qatar will also have a new implementation of water breaks because of the heat, 
And we want to capitalize on this opportunity to cut back to the studios and get presenters educating about mental health. Now, how will this be effective? Well, we believe that our solution will help tackle the issue of social norms and stigma, since sports tend to be watched in what's typically a macho environment, like pubs, parties, and streams. Secondly, we believe that we will boost emotional literacy uh, through increasing understanding of the symptoms and teaching concrete tips with long-lasting effects for the viewers. And lastly, we will increase access to support by overcoming the engagement obstacle and meeting men where they are. Okay, so why do we think this is going to work? In 2019, Heads Together partnered with the FA Cup to start the largest mental health conversation in the country. Now, what it did was delay all round free games of the FA Cup by 60 seconds, encouraging viewers like me and you to start thinking about our mental health. This resulted in over 87,000 people going on to create a personalized man plan to look after their mental health. We've also seen the massive success of the No Room for Racism campaign in the Premier League. And so we believe that there's some serious consensus within this sector to use their platform to advocate for change. Now we've identified key stakeholders who we believe would be up and receptive to making this policy initiative. Go ahead. So moving on, how will we measure success? In the short term, we want to implement mobile viewer questionnaires, uh, track the activities of mental health organizations that we partner with. But in the long term, we also, also want to study different mental health statistics and see the impacts on that, and also the suicide rates as well. But this idea has a lot of spillover effects, and we believe it's cost effective and very, very scalable. To summarize, every single person in this room has been affected by mental health, or someone you know will have been affected by mental health. We believe it's time to open the conversation through sports broadcasting. Thank you very much. I was just, just checking the, the bat of ignominy. It all seems fine. So uh, well done, uh, well done, gentlemen. Um, and I think uh, Suzanne can kick off. Thank you uh, for a really clear presentation. And I think it's a, a great idea for a campaign. And, and I think the references that you made to to the heads up, uh, no room for racism, there are really good parallels, I think, with, with, with what you're suggesting here. My worry is that if you encourage people to speak up, if you encourage people to share, unless you also invest in mental health services at the same time, you're encouraging more people to say they've got a problem, but there's no help for them to, to solve that problem. So I was wondering if you'd kind of thought about how it goes hand in hand with, with mental health funding, with actually access to GPs, to, to counselling and things like that. Thanks. Well, through our research, we found that one of the key themes was that even for the support that is available, there is an acute problem within the male population um, that they don't really engage with it. And so we believe that obviously this is a very vast issue and there's different elements that need to work together as you have identified. Um, but this is a great starting point to get men engaged with mental health um, institutions and services. Um, and we believe that um, in terms of being a campaign also, um, we believe that um, unifying the disparate elements of our, of our policy, which exists in isolation, and placing, placing it in center stage and um, seeking to induce long-term behavior changes is our, is our initial goal. Just to, just to expand on that, we, <clears throat> we obviously know that waiting times for NHS, GPs, mental health services are strained as they are. So by opening the conversation, it's, it's a reasonable criticism to have and a concern to have. But what we found, not through just academic literature, but people we've spoken to, uh, things we've you know, been in contact with Samaritan and Heads together, is that the main first step that people struggle with, which causes the most damage, is that initial reach out. Very few men, mainly because they don't want to look for it, don't know where to look for the support. So even if they just make the initial call and look for the support, that can, to be honest, be a really big help. And then. We obviously need to consider what we can do down the line to make that access more you know, doable with the finances. Uh, Louise Casey. So I guess the uh, fantastic, um, really important issue, like the others this evening, of its moment, and actually COVID, I think, has in some ways brought this, that it's, it's one of those issues we already knew was there. And what COVID has done is, is put more pressure and in some ways more attention to some of these issues and I think COVID gives um, all sorts of parts of the population a kind of reason to say they're not feeling okay uh, and they might have not been feeling okay before so I think um, I think you're right to look at the longer term historical data around um, certainly suicide and suicide attempts 
uh, particularly, uh, I suppose, in, in young men uh, that we're aware of. I guess the, the, the tough question is, you know, Prince William and Harry and uh, the Premier League, the Football Association, uh, you know, a lot of people have trod this road before this. And um, what's different about yours to Heads Up and some of the others? So um, Heads Up in particular, I'd like to have identified. Um, we've been in contact with Heads Up, and we have a dialogue with them in terms of learning about the difficulties they face, but also some of the successes, like we mentioned, in terms of engagement. Um, what all these campaigns do show um, is that it's an effective avenue to go down uh, in terms of sports broadcasting and messaging on societal issues. But what we want to do is we want to tie in these disparate campaigns and elements and have a universal message across different sports. These campaigns are limited because they're phrased as campaigns. They're framed as campaigns. And we believe um, that if we can frame it as a policy across uh, different sports, um, that we can raise the ceiling in terms of possibilities. And we can adapt this um, as time goes on as well. Okay. Yeah, um, That's really to, helpful. To contribute to that, the overall objective is a change in social norms. And that can't be done by a single campaign. Hence why this is a policy, policy instead. Thank Julia. You. Yeah, uh, I've Thank, thank you so much, and uh, I've got some experience in Australia with um, the power of um, sport and mental health advocacy. It happens uh, routinely with the um, uh, AFL, with our Aussie rules, where there's a, a game uh, each year that is about mental health, and there's a lot of advertising and player stories about mental health that go alongside that. So I think it is a really good way to reach men. So I, I absolutely applaud you on that. Um, in, in terms, can you just explain to me the um, reach? So you're using the terminology mandate uh, for the time um, and the imagery that would be used with the, the sporting event. Who would be doing the mandating? Do you imagine that that would need legislation? Um, and what, if any, pushback would you imagine from sporting codes around that, given, you know, every second of big games with lots of eyeballs on them is obviously very um, important revenue-raising space? So, um, I think regulation would be in the hands of a company called Ofcom. BBC are going to be showing the World Cup, who are obviously a state-owned broadcaster, so not privately financed. So there's less opportunity cost that they're missing out on in terms of adverts. Um, but in terms of regulation, because obviously we want these practices to stay, um, you know, stuck to, Ofcom are the people that decide in the UK um, who we work with just about the messaging that we'd want, make sure they don't deviate from it, make sure that everything is regulated as a law rather than a campaign, as is mandatory mental health messaging. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about how we want to private, pilot it with the BBC but then go, go private, so Premier League games, which are obviously who private broadcasters, whose main objective is obviously profit. Now, when you talk about advertising through uh, private broadcasters, money is obviously going to be a big thing. And they will lose financial cost with things like the mental health messaging. But as we've probably seen in the last two to three years, with Premier League games, no room for racism, that kind of social awareness, reputation is also a really big part of how these companies operate. Always want to go on the social norms, always want to ride this wave of, um, of kind of liberty and what, what we can do as a sport to tackle social, um, social problems. So I think that the opportunity cost that they have in terms of, oh, we might lose on a bit of advertising money here. If this is successful in the, in the World Cup, they're going to hop on the bandwagon. And the reputation cost that they'll suffer by not getting behind mandatory mental health messaging is probably going to cause them more damage than you know, a few thousand pounds on a messaging. And just to add to that, um, we believe that um, it fits in line uh, with the government's priorities as well. Um, and so we identify the DCMS as being the responsible government department for implementing this, uh, and then obviously for Ofcom to be regulating it once the policy is up and running. Um, but as we've identified that in their current years and priority outcomes, um, that this um, aligns with their, their vision to increase cohesiveness of communities. Um, and with the UK in particular, we're increasingly seeking to become a world leader in sports and sports broadcasting um, with stuff like the Premier League and seeking um, yeah. recently with the 2028 20, Euros bid. Uh, we want to build on our sporting successes as well. Uh, maybe not so much in cricket and stuff like the Ashes getting thrashed by Australia, um, but um, with England doing well in the World Cup, for example. Um, and so, yeah, we believe that there's a receptive environment at the moment, especially with 
also broadcasters jumping on the wave, the advocacy wave on societal issues, we believe that there, there, there is a receptive environment out there to get these people on board, and we're more than happy to engage in consultations with them as well. It's a clearly a hugely important issue. So huge thanks to, uh, to Samuel, to Olya, and to Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. So that's number number five on your uh, on your song sheet. Number six, our penultimate pitch, uh, comes from Pedro Braga, uh, who's studying <laughs> physics, and Max Riley, who's studying uh, politics. Which one's Pedro? You're Pedro. You're Max. Excellent. And that you've got an idea for a community-based pathway to lift people out of homelessness. There's, there's a bit of bit of uh, expertise on our panel around homelessness. So uh, good luck with that. You've got three minutes to convince. Louise Casey, uh, your time starts now. If God forbid you find yourself in a situation of homelessness, you most definitely face one of four issues. Mental health, physical health, economic distress, or the lack of social capital. However, all of us know someone who faced one of those issues before. But they didn't become, uh, they didn't get into a situation of living vulnerability. That's because most of us have a safety net of friends, family, and savings that can help us while we have a roof under, over our head. However, uh, the, today's policies towards homelessness expect people to recover from this situation with a third of the space that a 10-year-old child is entitled by law in England. This, it doesn't work. The data shows that it doesn't work for most people. What does work is offering people a home, a base on which they can work while they attempt to recover economically from homelessness and to give them the resources they need to actually make this recovery. This strategy, known as Housing First, has been used in a trial in Manchester. This trial found that using this strategy can cause a reduction in nights spent in prison by people in the program by up to 50%, and a reduction of up to 96% in hospital inpatient episodes. This strategy works, and it could work for potentially 16,450 people across the country, according to a parliamentary group, but today, it's only in use for about 2,000. The main reason is because, well, especially in London, there's just not enough housing. That's where our idea comes in. There's approximately 200,000 empty properties in England, and although not all of them can be used to house, house people they're, because they're either secondary homes or they're just not in good enough condition, approximately 29,000 of those properties, mainly in London, are in condition to be used on a housing first policy. We plan to acquire a target of 15,000 homes across London in order to roll out Housing First today and in the future. We plan to do this by offering property owners something incredibly exciting, tax benefits. <laughs> <laughs> we plan to offer capital gains tax benefits to property owners, like so, and also provide, provide them with management services for their properties. We, we believe that we can net them a, an estimated eight. 80,800 pounds over the course of a five-year contract period, making this a financial no-brainer for property owners. You'd probably think that this would be incredibly expensive for the government, but actually no. Data from the Manchester Housing First trial shows that because of all the savings that we'll have in the, between the justice and NHS systems, we can actually expect the national government to net around 3,000 pounds per person per year involved in this program. And local authorities, who will no longer have to pay for housing and providing services, will net up to around 10,000 pounds per person per year. This strategy is going to get us the housing we need while being financially beneficial for basically everyone involved. And with the help of the community, we can help increase the mental health and the social capital of those individuals and help them get back on their feet, lifting them back from homelessness. Thank you very much. Another really important topic, and I, I must say, I thought very well laid out uh, argument, uh, Pedro and Max. And I can't remember, is it Louise who's going to come in first? Well, I think she's coming in first anyway. Yeah. Uh, Louise. So, um, th listen, it's always fantastic to have uh, homelessness right up there. And I think in my four ish years of doing Policy Idol, I think this is the first time that we've had a, a specific uh, proposal on homelessness. So, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I suppose, um, oh, oh, um, I, I suppose that, you know, 
God knows people have been here before on this basis that there are, you know, thousands of empty properties. The difference you're suggesting, I wonder why you think that the financial uh, offer that you're making, is it different in your view to the offers that have been made to people before? Um, because on the whole, those properties do not become vacant um, and are not accessible to uh, homeless households. And many people have trodden that route before because it seems really straightforward. Why have you got this, you know, flat above a shop? We had a whole flat above shops under the uh, major era. There's been loads of initiatives in this area and none of them get to where you're suggesting. So have you done any sort of look at why particularly the tax benefits might be more attractive to people than others? And then the other thing to say is housing first is bloody expensive. Um, there is no way around that, and that the cost-benefit analysis you're referring to in the Manchester pilot would not stack up to the Treasury. Um, and that, you know, I love Housing First. I love the idea that somebody uh, isn't on the street but is actually getting a wraparound load of support. But you're talking in the Manchester pilot at about £7,500 per person. So, essentially, that's, that is more than we would have spent on, uh, I think it was James's uh, palliative care. So if you look at sometimes what we're spending on homelessness, and remember I'm the woman that does as much as is humanly possible to get people to do something about homelessness, I think there's a slight flaw in your reliance on one pilot, and indeed on Housing First in Scotland, that is running at about 5,500 per capita or per person. So why do you think you've thought of something that nobody else has thought of before? And secondly, are you really sure about your wonderful Manchester? And I love Manchester. Did, if, uh, Andy <laughs> okay, if anybody's Twittering Andy Burnham, just tell him I love him, OK? So we're all clear on that. Manchester are at least trying to do more than many other cities for which they deserve enormous credit. OK. That's a pretty comprehensive list of questions. <laughs> well, you made a mistake of going for homelessness. <laughs> <laughs> It so, was a great presentation, and you're guessing at something we really need to get to. It is morally reprehensible that we have empty properties and we have human beings dying on the streets. So you are in the right place, guys. That, that are you have my 100% support over. Thank you. I, I, think, I think that the amount of money that we're providing with the capital tax, um, with, with the uh, capital tax gain benefit um, is an amount that is not going to be that different from what's been proposed before. The main benefit of this is that the government's going to have to be paying for it in the future rather than immediately, so hopefully we'll be able to see the benefits in terms of the cost before the costs arrive in the future. Um, the main difference that we're really offering in terms of this program is providing for the maintenance and care of the facility. The thing is that renting a property, even if you're renting it to the government, is not easy work. You have to pay for management, utilities, maintenance, all sorts of stuff. And it is a hassle. It's stressful and it's so stressful that lots of people who own properties don't even want to rent them out. The difference for our program from other programs is that while yes, it's providing that financial incentive, it's also entirely taking the responsibility for caring for that property off of your hands. So all you're doing if you have one of these extra properties is saying, you know, here's the property and then you're pretty much just getting that 80,000 pounds without much work. So we think that this framework would be, I don't know, a little bit more, there would be more incentives for property owners under this framework to join our program. Okay. Judith. Just um, sort of picking up on some of the points that Louise made, uh, the, the issues here around homelessness, obviously people um, having somewhere to stay, which is not on the street and homeless, is uh, pivotal. Uh, but the, the wraparound services make a huge difference for people getting beyond that, mm. you know, reliance on, on this sort of um, innovative model of uh, social housing and being able to get on with their lives on their own terms. So how are you factoring that into the model? So you've got the... you. Let's assume that the release of the property works because uh, property owners think this is a good deal, so the homeless person is in a property. What else happens to support them? Well, first of all, we're hoping to provide a lot of the individual services that are being provided by Housing First already. We didn't really get into the details in our presentation because we were a little short on time, 
but that's going to involve a um, each person in each person experiencing homelessness getting connected with a personal caseworker who's basically going to um, guide them and provide them with all of the services they need. But in addition to that, also um, we are planning on ha having the community around the properties being used to participate in that type of um, tackle to the situation. In Scotland, a trial was made, and it showed that when the people facing those situations uh, per were like participating in activities with members of the community, their mental health, their um, their self-esteem, like a lot of uh, drug, uh, drug and alcohol abuse went down. So having the members of the community helping them uh, is something that we are very focused on because it creates a much more humane connection and not much of that bureaucratic, is a government official having to deal with me because I am a statistic kind of point of view that people normally have towards uh, this issue. And according to some official data from the British government, uh, around 41% of British people are involved at least once a month in some time of communal uh, volunteer activity. So I think that the population would be willing to participate and aid in this type of uh, approach to the inclusion and the lifting of those people. Interesting, Suzanne. Thanks very much, and really great, as Louise was saying, to see Manchester getting referenced because they're doing some really interesting work right now around yeah. homelessness. Um, and that kind of picks up on one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you, which I guess you can think of two different ways of tackling homelessness. One, you can give people homes, but you can also give people money, and you can empower, you can empower them to make their own choices about where they live and the kind of poverty that they live in. So I was wondering why this instead of something like more direct cash transfers which are being evaluated around the world and there are lots of really interesting international examples mm -hmm. about about the success of that kind of policy yes uh, we talked with um, Susanna Hume in the yeah. policy Institute and we were talking about cash transfers and how they are doing some trials right now at King's with this type of uh, approach and we when we were analyzing the data Everything that uh, reference Housing First plays a lot of emphasis on uh, putting people inside a home under a roof without asking any questions, take a lot of the burden on them and allow them to make more rational decisions, uh, not rational, but better decisions, more thought through decisions. Because if you're sleeping under a bridge, you, you it, I can even imagine the emotional and mental burden that that might be. And I'm aware that I personally wouldn't be in my best position to make the most, like, well, the best financial, financial decisions possible. So I think that that's a very good point that can be implemented inside the housing first and like giving money so they, uh, to those individuals so they could participate in the social activities that would like increase their safety net. But I believe, uh, we believe that Putting them inside a home under a roof is like the mo the first thing that must be done. So they have the a little bit of, of emotional and mental room to be able to think about, okay, how I'm gonna use this money, what I'm gonna do with it, how I can try to manage the situation now that I have a bed to sleep. We also should talk about the kind of people that this program is targeting. Um, housing first and this, which is kind of like an extension of Housing First, is mainly aimed at people who are experiencing some combination of physical, mental um, health issues that is making it very, that it's making other interventions ineffective. Um, so people who are going to be housed, like using this, these program, are, are using this program are people who would benefit more from the type of wraparound support that would be provided through, that would be provided by this and that wouldn't be provided by direct Direct payments might be preferable for different groups of people, especially people who are just quickly transitioning through homelessness. But this program, which is targeted more at people experiencing long-term homelessness, um, for this program, cash transfers, transfers might not be the best solution. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed to, to Pedro and to Max for their presentation. Number six in your song sheet. Thanks very much, gentlemen.
Really, uh, really impressive how the kind of wicked issues of which homelessness is definitely one are being taken on by our policy idol pitches tonight. It's, it's, it's brave. And of course, people have been around the track on many of these issues many times. But it's terrific that we are having uh, really thinking about them. They're not going to go away. Um, our final pitch is a quartet. Do come up. Our first quartet. We've got Grace Miller. Where's Grace? Uh, we've got Madison Greenhall. We've got Emily I. And we've got Abigail Wallop. And uh, your postgrad students study a range of topics like global health and social justice, conflict, security, global development. This pitch is called Shifting the Responsibility Policy Recommendations to Reduce Drink Spiking in the UK. Well, the four of you, you have just three minutes starting now. All right. So amongst the four of us, half of us have experienced an incident of drink spiking during our time at university. Drink spiking has recently been classified an epidemic in the UK by sources such as the BBC, which is why tonight we're going to be talking to you about shifting the responsibility, our policy recommendations to battle drink spiking in the UK. A frightening statistic from Manchester in December of last year shows 57 cases of drink spiking reported to the police in one single week. Even closer to home, right across the river from where we are now, is a pub called Dover Castle, often frequented by KCL students. It's represented by the star on the map. KCL students often go here because it is so close to King's campuses and accommodations, shown by the orange squares. And in October of last year, there were six incidents of spiking in one single evening. Southwark Council's alcohol strategy, which applies to Dover Castle, hasn't been updated since 2016 and doesn't even reference drink spiking. The London police, as well as the Greater Manchester police, have recommendations for partygoers, such as to watch your drink, go out with friends, and stay vigilant. We find these recommendations to be inadequate, and we would like to shift the responsibility of protecting yourself from drink spiking off of the individual and onto the venues. Some of you might have seen this image from the popular TV show, Stay Close, where a young woman is depicted able to test her drink using a color-changing nail polish. While we wish the solution we were offering was this simple, unfortunately, technology like that does not exist. That's why tonight we are presenting a three-pillared policy to addressing drink spiking in the United Kingdom. The first pillar of our policy is a recommendation for free NHS-distributed drink spike testing kits. These testing kits will be funded by a tax on the alcohol industry in order to ensure that the NHS does not receive an undue burden. In the same way that you might be able to go online and get a collect code for a set of lateral flows today, you'll be able to go online and get a collect code for a drink test in kit before you go for a night out. The second pillar of our approach is the introduction of an additional security guard at the bar or a security camera focused on the bar itself. We believe that this physical and surveillance presence will deter any potential perpetrators and help to catch situations before they escalate. The third pillar of our approach is a requirement for all venue employees to take the online continued professional learning drink spiking awareness course. This free online course helps venue employees recognize the signs of a drink spiking incident, help get medical assistance for the affected individual, and to report the case to the proper authorities. In order to ensure that venues meet these new standards, we want to attach the standards to the annual premise license fee. Venues must meet these standards before they pay their annual fee or within six months of the policy enacting. We believe that drink spiking has reached epidemic levels, and in order to make a massive difference and protect British consumers, we need to shift the responsibility onto the venues and off of the individual. Thank you very much, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Had you, really, had you really finished? Did you have more to say? Or, that was it. That was it. That was, that was it. For, uh, almost, almost to the millisecond. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that excellent presentation. Um, uh, Julia, yes. The, the nail polish would be a fantastic thing, wouldn't it? Someone <laughs> needs to invent that. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Very good set of ideas. Um, can I ask what set you in the direction of... Uh, the kit. I mean, do you do you think I, I understand drink testing, but do you think in most circumstances that um, kits would get used? Can you um, you know I mean in a situation people are out for a social night, there's no reason um, at the outset to assume that they're at risk. Um, would people be using a kit, or is it the sort of thing that 
you know, sort of doesn't, doesn't get used and therefore isn't really going to prevent the situation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually there were three petitions that were recently put forward um, in the, into the House of Commons and these petitions had over 40,000 signatures surrounding drink spiking. Unfortunately, it did not move forward into any form of legislation. Um, so we believe that there is a current public appetite for drink testing. The drink tests that we are proposing, um, you can get them in a pack of 10. They're one pound a test. So you can get them in that pack of 10. You can have them like you know, in your bathroom. If you're thinking, oh, I'm going to a place. Maybe I'm not familiar with this place. You can bring it with you, carry it in your purse. And it's one singular strip. And you don't even have to put the testing strip into the drink itself. You can discreetly tap your finger into the drink and use one drop to test for two um, specific types of date rape drugs. In addition, it's besides being super easy, it's a piece of evidence that you can have as well. Because right now, if you want to get tested, it goes through your system really quickly. And so the issue with that is it's up to the paramedic or the medical professional that you go and see to even if they decide to test you or not. It's exceptionally hard to get, to have that proof saying, I feel like this has happened, can you please test me? And it's still not being enough to get that test. Um, and amongst that, um, in a study done by the Alcohol Education Trust in October of last year, um, people who did rep um, say that they had been spiked before, 92% did not report it to the police. And we feel like this is oftentimes because when people are spiked, it is because they are out drinking and they might question the next day, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm with spiked. I'm not sure I don't feel comfortable enough going to the police because I feel like they won't believe me. I'm not confident in myself. And having this kit is such an easy way to have like step one form of evidence. So is, can I just be curious, is, is this about, um, oh, I think I may have been spiked and testing it there and then. Or was it an idea about stopping the spiking in the first place? You, you sort of test your drink. Because I think Julia's point was, actually, which one of us is really going to think, well, just, just double check that my gin and tonic's not, uh, not being spiked. Whereas, perhaps if you're thinking, oh, that felt a bit weird, you might do it then. Which way around is it? So this is something that would stop before you end up being actually spiked. In the way that you just suggested, you would, in fact, test your drink if you find that you might be in a situation where you don't necessarily trust where it came from. Say somebody else you just met for the first time is buying you a drink, but you don't entirely know who they are, and you want a way to ensure that they aren't going to try to take advantage of you. It's subtle in the way that the testing strip is so small, and the fact that it only needs a drop of liquid means it can be done in a discreet way. You don't need to bring it out and put it in, but having a drinking spiking incident of any kind is traumatic, and if you can stop it before it actually happens, to make a massive difference in that individual's life. Okay. Suzanne. Thank you very much, all of you, for a really clear and powerful presentation, and particularly for sharing your personal experience as well, which I'm, I'm sorry that you have gone through. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about the venues. So, so one of your pillars is, is bringing the venues on board, having extra security, making sure that they're trained. I'm conscious that the venues hospitality have had a really difficult 24 months. Um, how can you encourage them to, to get on board with this policy? How can you bring them along with you? So we know that um, the venues do have an appetite for this type of policy. After the Dover Castle incident that we mentioned in our um, briefing, um, they installed 16 of their own surveillance cameras. So we know that they are conscious of this as an issue and they have an initiative to prevent it. So we do not feel that um, bringing venues necessarily on board is going to be that difficult because they have this initiative and the way that our policy is set out is a matter of choice. You don't have to have an extra security guard. You don't have to have surveillance, but it's a choice of which one makes more sense for you. Do we want an extra security camera on the bar or do we have an extra staff that we can hire, which is cheaper? So there's some flexibility in that. In addition, you have the option of the, of the moral option, obviously, is, is one to consider, but also the reputation. If I hear from my friend that she or he may have gotten spiked from this venue, I'm going to be wary about going there. And I don't want to bring my friends there who may be visiting me from out of town, or even the ones I see every day, to somewhere where they could potentially be in danger. And also, in terms of the Dover Castle example, part of the reason why they installed these new security cameras is because King's groups were bo boycotting the bar for a week. So economically to their advantage to add in the cameras. Um, we aren't using this policy as a way to attack venues. We're using it as a way to help them. They should want to work with us because overall it's in their best interest to protect um, their attendees.
It also means that venues have a way to support victims that come forward with a claim. If they have some sort of evidence of the situation happening, they might be able to help that individual out and therefore become a more reputable institution. Louise. Um, I, I, I am guilty of being a person that watched the Netflix, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Harbin Coven thing, and actually earlier today I was saying to a friend and colleagues, I, I think that you just stick your finger in the thing, and, <laughs> and then it, then it, and, I was, and then I thought, oh my God, you're going to embarrass yourself by saying, well, I think it's been fast. But fortunately, I popped it in Google and realised that actually it is just a, a just a program, but how great that would be. Um, so listen, this is, I mean, this is well thought through. I love things that are three-pronged. I don't know why <laughs> it just works. <laughs> Tips to anybody in the future. Three prongs always goes down well with, you know, policy dinosaurs like me. Um, Three, five or ten point plans. No, <laughs> you on the head. Yeah, Julia, no, you never come up with a seven point plan. Seriously, <laughs> never come up with it. You're absolutely right. Never seven. Three on ten. Mm. Anyway, meanwhile, um, I sort of, again, I'm just wondering about sort of uh, there's two issues. One is some spiking is actually people just putting much more alcohol in. So there's a lot of sticking a double of vodka in when somebody's already wobbly and just getting them therefore to be more compliant, uh, using alcohol to make them more compliant. And I wondered where, where that is in this. I, I mean, I do think what's really interesting is, um, you know, every single parent of anybody, I would imagine, that had any money at all would happily go out and buy endless tests and kits if they thought it would keep their uh, sons and daughters safe when, when they go to venues. So two, two questions. One is kind of, one, just genuinely, sort of how does this work when people are just literally sticking extra alcohol in to, to get control of someone? And, and, uh, and, and secondly, it's like, why do you think, I guess, that this has not been picked up given the high profile nature of spiking that was all over the news uh, um, uh, in a very high profile way. So I'm just getting away with two questions. Two questions, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. To, to cover the first bit about the additional alcohol, um, part of our program does cover that with the uh, CPL learning course. The learning course that we are um, promoting in this initiative does promote um, education for the bar staff for when someone is intoxicated learning a difference between intoxication versus when someone is on a drug that they might not be aware of. That's very true. So um, it is part of our current policy, and in the recent alcohol duty tax reform, they do discuss um, health measures for people that overconsume. And um, I kind of had a problem with this alcohol duty tax reform because they were really targeting health measures for overconsumption and saying that on trade venues that are the target, the venues that we are targeting, the um, bars, clubs, and um, pubs, that these are safer and that they are not going to put any money, more money forward for health initiatives because these are deemed as safer by health professionals. Whereas we've seen in the news that these epidemics are happening at these venues and they are not safer. Absolutely. Someone just to answer the second thing about why, why are people not doing more about this given the, the publicity that it's had? Yes, so first of all, it's chronically under underreported. Yes, it's, it, it's an epidemic and numbers and personal stories are coming out more in fervor, which is amazing. Um, and as we said before, it was seen, there's petitions, it was seen in parliament, and they said that there was measures already in place to address this. Um, and another reason is the burden on the NHS, which is why we introduced the idea of a, a tax on the alcohol industry. And because of this burden and the fear of, you know, over, you know, Putting too much on the NHS, it's already doing far too much um, right now, is a, a big fear. And then one more thing on the first point, within the training course there is, and also for the bar staff specifically on not allowing people to add extra um, drinks to an already ordered drink as a specific um, line of training. Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, I think we've had an amazing presentation again. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Grace, Madison, Emily, and Abigail. Thank you very much indeed. Well, what, a, what an amazing uh, set of presentations we've had. Uh, we've seen all seven contenders for the, for the glittering prize that is Policy Idol 2022. Uh, thank you to all of our, our pitchers. The judging panel will now be putting their collective head together, creating a, a policy brain of such size and complexity it is actually visible from the International Space Station, uh, if, if it hasn't crashed. 
Um, but you, as I say, also have a key part in, uh, in deciding which of our idol contenders walks away with the coveted audience prize. Uh, you need to zap the QR code on your, uh, on your table, uh, do something fancy with your mobile phone, and then you'll be in a thing, and then you press a button, and that's how it works. Uh, you have somewhere between now and half an hour to gather your thoughts and uh, accept any bribes and inducements, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much indeed.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the judges have been released from their quarantine. Their minds are made up. If you could return to your seats, uh, your votes have also been counted, um, and we'll uh, we'll produce the winners any moment now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are but moments away from learning who are the winners of Policy Idol 2022. And to, uh, to present the prizes, it's my great pleasure to ask Julia, Julia Gillard, to join me here. Thank you very much. There are, as you know, there are four, four prizes in all. Uh, and the first prize that I'm going to announce is the prize for style. Is that matching? No, it's the wrong one. <laughs> Should I tell you now? It's going to be st style, substance, audience overall. Okay, that's the order. Right. Uh, now, price for style. Uh, there is money attached, ladies and gentlemen. The price for style is worth 500 smackaroonies. Um, so, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of interest, I'm sure, uh, among all those who provided such brilliant pictures tonight. And I can tell you that the winner, or the winners, of this part of the competition are... Samuel, Olia, and Lawrence, whose performance on men's mental health. Do please come up. Come on, boys. Well done. Many congratulations. There we are. And it's all, all signed certificates as well. So that, there's been a lot of signing going on while you were partying in here. But there we are. We'll, oh, we're doing photos now. Excellent. Do you need, do you need a, bit of, a, bit, a bit of focus on the camera, if you wouldn't mind? There we go. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. And congratulations to Samuel, Olia, and Lawrence. Right. The second prize tonight is for the winner of Substance. Again, another £500. Um, and the winners, again, are Aditi Francis, Karen, for their Accessibility Traffic Lights presentation. Certificates with the right people. A smile for the camera. And £500 is yours. Congratulations! <laughs> right, the next prize is the audience prize, which pitch you thought uh, was the most persuasive. And the winner, or the winners, are Aditi Francis and Karen. You need to come back again. You won two. You know the drill. Come on. Another photo op. Fantastic. Many, many congratulations. Well, by my maths, that's 750 spondulics that you've got to spend. I was suggesting that actually you're probably better going with a smaller team because then you get more money. But maybe, uh, maybe what this is telling us is that, that uh, the groups do, do well. Anyway, we come now to the moment we've all been waiting for, the announcement of the, the overall winner, the champion uh, of Policy Idol 2022. And the overall champion tonight is our Grace Madison, Emily and Abigail for their presentation on drink spiking.
Massive checks. Going to be hellishly difficult to bank that. A thousand pounds, though. Many, many congratulations. I'm tempted to say the drinks are on you tonight, but maybe that's not suitable. Many congratulations. Well done. Very good. Very good. Hollering, whooping, that's what we need. Excellent stuff. Congratulations to Grace, Madison, Emily and Abigail. Uh, I can tell you the judges thought it was an absolutely uh, splendid presentation. They probably would have won on almost every category, so very well done to you. Um, and I'd now like to inv uh, invite the Executive Dean at the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy, Professor Linda McKee, to say a few words about tonight's event. Well, good evening. This is the ninth year of Policy Idols. And I'd like to first off say that 85 different teams started out in this process. Seven got to the final, and we've got an amazing array of friends, family, etc., who've supported this process along the way. So I want us to stop for a moment, put our hands together, and give a big round of applause to all 85 teams and thank everybody who came up with amazing ideas. <laughs> now, one of the key aims of the Policy Idols competition is to encourage us all to look around to think about those key social problems, to think about how we can develop ideas to address those challenges. And I think many of us can go home tonight fully aware that the future generation of politicians, of policymakers, of academics, we're safe. You are our successors, and boy, oh boy, did you prove yourselves tonight. A fabulous series of presentations. People were calm, they were confident, they took on some of those big, big issues. Moving forward, we know that there are challenges ahead for all of us, not least with the war in Ukraine, where we're heading. Let's hope we're together next year. And let's hope that we will have different types of problems to address. And that some of your ideas tonight will go further. Now, I'm privileged to be working in the faculty which hosts the Policy Institute. But I'm fully aware that there are students here tonight from right across the college. And they're being supported by academic colleagues, professional services over the university. So I think we should recognize the integrated, interdisciplinary nature of our work at King's. But before we close, tonight would not have been possible without the work of the Policy Institute colleagues, without the events team, without the catering team and security. And I'd like to thank all of them, our judges and Mark, very much for giving up their time this evening to celebrate the energy and ideas which go to make up policy idols. So look forward to seeing you in 2023. And meantime, let's stay safe out there and let's get going with some of those changes that we need to make to make this a better society, a more just society. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Linda. Policy Idol 2022 is almost at a close. If I could add my thanks to all our potential idols, I was, I was really hugely impressed with, I know, the huge amount of work that's gone in to all those presentations. They really were an incredible display of, of talent. Uh, and to our judges, who achieved the nigh on impossible in ranking such a, a varied range of ideas and pitches. As I said at the start, Linda just, just mentioned it too, the world is facing some very significant challenges at the moment, and it's 
it's so important that we encourage the brightest and the best to put their minds to solving the policy conundrums of our time. It is just great. Policy Idol is back in the real world. Um, I would ask that all our finalists uh, stay uh, for a few photos. Um, but to everyone else, it's been, a, it's been a wonderful evening. Farewell and a safe journey home. Thanks very much for making Policy Idol 2022 such a great event. Good night. Good night.